Thank you so much for taking, having taken the time. Let's get started with today's session. So we'll start off with a quick overview on what's happening right now as we speak in the whole uh, cybersecurity and identity access management platform. We're gonna be going on and discussing a couple of key points around how do you go about <clears throat> preventing your organization against the cybersecurity threats that our organizations around the world are facing as we speak. We're talking about insider threats that are improving and we're talking about attacks that are all COVID based and COVID themed. That is the idea for today's session. Just like I said, the presentation is being recorded. Thank you so much for having taken the time. In case if you have questions during the course of the webinar, feel free to shoot your questions then and there and try, try to take as many questions as possible. Alrighty, so let's quickly get started for today's webinar. So yeah, the whole idea of how the security landscape is evolving is pretty much around what we get to do around remote working. Now, as we speak, a lot of us are working remotely, no exception. I also work remotely and I've been doing it for the last 120 days. We've got about an organization of uh, you know 8,000 folks and all of us are working remotely. During the last 100 days, we've been able to help other organizations go remote. And in the process, we've been able to learn a lot of stuff. What I intend to do through today's session is essentially educate you as to how do you go about coping up with the altered reality. They're calling it the new normal. Back in the day, we had the provision to secure our entire network with what we call our SIM solutions or our firewall and so on and so forth. But now, this is changing. And why is this changing? That's essentially because identities are becoming the very perimeter of your network. And we're talking about a scenario where your users are bringing their own devices to work. And in addition to just bringing their own devices, they don't just bring that uh, to work. They also bring their own vulnerabilities along with them. And that is what causes all the trouble. So it boils down to one simple question do you trust your users and what do you do to go forward uh, especially when it comes to privilege escalation and privilege management what do you do how do you handle that do you trust your users because these are the same users who write their passwords on a piece of paper or on a sticky note and have it stuck right on top of their desktops while they are at work what do you do at that point in time now we have to ensure that we kind of make the whole cybersecurity foolproof and we are talking about a very moving and a flexible and a dynamic part of the equation where users are going to do uh, things that you don't want them to do, like clicking on emails that are malicious. So we'll try and understand as to how do we go about both preventing accidental insider threats and insider threats that have an intent. So we'll go forward understanding what are the key events that you need to keep a close track on. We'll talk about telltale signs that will help your organization go forward and help you save yourself from a critical security breach. We'll also talk about preventing ourselves from insider threats of the start and automate the whole incident re incidents response as we go forward. Okay. When you see it's pretty straightforward, right? What does an attacker look for? They look for an opportunity. They look for an opportunity to just get hold of your users, understand their behavioral pattern, see if they can do anything about uh, an opportunity to you know crack one of those accounts and as we speak there are a lot of business email compromises that are occurring as we speak so how do you counter all of that is the million dollar question now attackers are getting extremely smart they have sophisticated bots that are working in their favor but what do administrators have while our users are working remotely because no longer within your system no longer within your premise your SIM solutions aren't going to be of great help. In addition to that, your network security is also taking a backstage. And Microsoft, in fact, went on to make this one announcement about how the security landscape has modified. And we are talking about a situation or a scenario where, <clears throat> you know, uh, once an account is compromised, it takes very little time or less than like one or two days for the attacker to go through the entire system and find out where the domain admin credentials are. We are talking about Active Directory where your users or one with even the most basic privilege like a read privilege can very much use an LDAP query to find out who the administrator is. This essentially means this isn't, this isn't the best of securities to go forward, right? Uh, this is probably only the half of the problem. 
there's a lot more to the whole deal of security equation right here, not just admin accounts being compromised, but data exfiltration that follows. So what do you do about that? How do you ensure that you keep a tab on your data? Because now, while your users are working remotely, it is all the more difficult to transact and keep a tab on the data that is flowing front and back in and out of your system. And attackers have an easy way out to hide or effectively camouflage or go under the radar while any of these attacks are happening. And they start exfiltrating data. We had run surveys uh, across organizations and we were able to just spot one commonality between all these issues. Now these attacks and breaches that we're talking about are taking more time than they are supposed to take. And that is fundamentally because attackers are, uh, you know, trying to use this opportunity available, clear all their tracks or breadcrumbs and make it difficult for your organization. So the recommendation that I have for you today is to start with this approach in mind that you possibly can already be under an attack. A lot of organizations, not just, uh, you know, uh, healthcare organizations that are under attack, educational institutions, financial institutions, so on and so forth, just because they are working remotely, it becomes easy uh, for an attacker to crack through their system. So that in mind, along with what's been happening in the last couple of months, we see a tremendous spike in phishing attacks. Now, if you're wondering, why exactly are phishing attacks a problem? Our users are trained and our systems are also trained to stop phishing attacks. We're talking about attacks that are themed COVID. We're talking about emails that pretend to be from the World Health Organization or the CDC. And users nevertheless fall prey for these attacks, click on these emails and give away their credentials. Now, this is the last thing that you'd want to have on your mind while you're dealing remote work. And in fact, with no exception, uh, I received an email a couple of days back. Uh, uh, you know, this was from the Indian government saying that they're giving away a huge deal of some mass compensation for all of them who are affected. Now, a lot of people fell victim for this. They went on to give away their social security numbers and so on and so forth. And even before the government could step in and stop the attack, a lot of damage was already done. So we are talking about how do you go forward and educate your users to not fall prey for these attacks? Because your users are going to be using the same devices that are compromised. And these attacks essentially uh, follow, are followed up with a malware installation. And that malware without, within no time can percolate into your system as well. So that's the biggest question. Back in the day, you knew what your users were doing. You were able to keep a close tab on your user activity and stop any malware installations. But while your users are bringing their own devices, there's how much you could do about it. So being able to monitor key aspects of your network security, again, plays a very big role right here. So what I've done is I've kind of put together a couple of uh, points uh, that are essentially around monitoring insider activity users who are within your organization and what exactly are they doing with their privileges. We'll start off right there because all these attacks are pointing towards just one understanding. Either it's the insiders who are accidentally sharing their credentials or falling prey for a social engineering attack or insiders who've gone rogue and trying to exfiltrate your organization's data. We do not want both of it. So how do you stop that from happening any further? So that's the question right here. So we'll start off with something as basic as Active Directory and events in Active Directory that you'd want to monitor. The first and foremost event, my recommendation to you would be to start monitoring logon activity. Now, logon activity is a great measure or a foolproof mechanism to identify if you have context to it. If there are any deviations, like repeated logon failures, it could be a potential attacker trying to crack through it. Again, if you know the time of the logon and if there's a deviation in the time of the logon, logon that is happening during non-business hours, logon items that are made on inactive accounts with critical privileges. Now, that is definitely something that you need to be looking into. So when it's tracking that you're doing, start off by monitoring these two events, both successful logon and failed logon with event IDs 4624 and 4625. So let's get started with that idea. And then we'll go a little forward to talk about privilege and how privilege escalations happen in your organization. Now, if you were to do it in real time, what options do you have? You've got the event viewer, but there's this innate challenge with event viewer, right? 
it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. How exactly do you plan to look through your entire event log and find out what exactly happened? And you can't even correlate a couple of logs right there. It becomes difficult at a given point in time. You just be able to pinpoint to a specific event and turn on auditing for that. What about threat response? What about correlation? What about intelligence? There's nothing intelligent about that. So look for solutions that can help you not just track these critical events, but also give you actionable insights. That's my first recommendation. Now, when it comes to privilege escalations that we want to discuss about, group membership changes are where you should start looking for. Now, right after an attack does a credential compromise or does an account takeover, they try to modify group memberships. And when they try to do it, it all boils down to just three group membership event IDs that you'll want to monitor. 4728, 32, and 56. You can grab a quick screenshot if you want to. This is one of the most important slides in today's presentation. You can quickly grab a screenshot if need be. So we're talking about these three group uh, membership changes event IDs that are pertaining to security groups, universal groups, and local groups if members are being added to it. So this is what the attacker does. They crack through it. They add more members. They literally move. They escalate their privileges so that it becomes almost impossible to find out from where or which direction is the attack happening. They try to hide in plain sight. So. If you're able to track changes that happen to critical groups and quickly identify as to what group and which users having those privileges, you'd be able to do a lot with that. That's one recommendation that I have for you. You wouldn't really want to stop right there. You'd also want your solution to be a little smart. Maybe do a quick user behavior analytics. See where the logon initiated from the IP reputation of the uh, source, a couple of other factors, and put together a actionable insight because it could be a legitimate activity and you don't want a false positive. So being able to monitor changes to group membership and doing it without being hindered by false positive is a critical aspect of putting together a cybersecurity strategy or an event monitoring strategy for your organization. Now, account lockouts, again, my favorite example. Account lockouts can have two perspectives to them. One of them being the instance where your accounts are locked out because of a forgetful user. Now that's a classic case. Users forget their passwords. Users mistype their passwords over and over, and that ends up locking their account. That is okay. That is understandable. But what about users or credentials that are stale? What about a cybersecurity attack? What about a poor network drive mapping? Now you should at any given point in time be able to call out whether it's a cybersecurity incident that was the reason for an account lockout or was it a logistical uh, issue, a day-to-day -day, uh, identity access management operation that was the issue. So you should be in the know and be able to call out such a change that is happening in your organization. That's another recommendation that I have for you today. So look for solutions that help you do account lockout analysis. That's my next recommendation for you. Now, the event ID that is associated with account lockouts are 4740. So please do ensure that you have this event ID turned on for monitoring. Now, besides that, you'd also want to take into account options like file and folder access. Why would I say that? Now, when it comes to file and folder access, there are a lot of things uh, associated with data security that go with these event IDs. Now, when it comes to a strong data access governance strategy, it, it, it is almost all times insufficient uh, if you do not have a strong file integrity monitoring in place. So your data integrity, file integrity, they go hand in hand. Your disaster recovery plan also very much depends upon how quickly can you figure out where what file was accessed and what modifications were done to it. Because if you want to quickly do a restore or if you want to like stop a ransomware and re recover uh, a few uh, encrypted files, this is where you look for. So please turn on 4663 tracking on your event viewer and then get going. Yes, all these said and done, attackers also tend to do this one thing. They try to clear their tracks just to make it a little more complicated for someone who's doing a root cause analysis. Attackers go on and turn off the event log uh, or clear the whole event log. And that also leaves a breadcrumb and you'd be able to pinpoint from where it all started. So a couple of activities or events that I'd want to monitor are listed right here. I'm going to give you 
a quick second to go through them one more time or make a note of them because you can go back and have these event IDs turned on for auditing. Lovely. I hope you taken a screenshot or made a note. What I do is I'd also send the presentation deck. So do not worry just in case if you weren't able to make a note, but it will go a little further. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to put together a solid cybersecurity strategy for insider threats. And you can start with something as simple as identifying as to what are the telltale signs. Where do you start looking for? And when these attackers initiate these activities, they nevertheless give away a few clues for you to identify. Now, if you want to be the Sherlock, you'll have to start with log on failures. Now, what exactly is a brute force attack? I can probably give you an example. A telltale sign for a brute force attack would be repetitive log on failures that happen in a very short span of time, followed by one successful log on and all of this initiated from that same IP address. Now, this is a classic sign. For this, you must have turned on the log on auditing and you should also have a threshold based alert that tells you that there were 100 repetitive log on failures in under a minute. So that is definitely a telltale sign. And what if it's a password spray attack? Password spray attacks are a little more smarter than brute force attacks because they tend to not leave away any breadcrumbs. Now, when I'm talking about breadcrumbs, we're talking about the attacker trying to not just uh, attack one single account with multiple passwords, but maybe attack multiple accounts with one password until they crack. And we know how uh, weak Active Directory password policies are. Now, Active Directory password policies are almost about two decades old and they haven't been updated. So is the case with a lot of identity providers, even Azure AD for that matter, or a lot of other identity platforms, they do not have the best in class password policies. All of them talk about uppercase, lowercase, having a combination of letters, not using previous passwords, but there are obvious security loopholes, like not being able to stop users from using dictionary words. Now, if you had the right tools to track where all the uh, attack of a weak password or a uh, you know multiple logons attempts were made from one single source ip you'd be able to quickly call that out as an attack or a password spray attack that's the idea behind it and most commonly the easiest route for attackers to get into an organization is to have some insider helping them now we are talking about insiders who have the privileges insiders who know what are the inactive accounts in your organization and probably try to use those inactive accounts with privileges to initiate the attack because it becomes very difficult to find out who did that in the first place. So if dominant accounts with credentials or with admin privileges or with the keys to the kingdom are out there, attackers would want to take advantage of that. Now, I have a very nice tip for you right here. If this is a problem, you can counter that problem by starting to clear out all your dormant accounts and inactive accounts with privileges. As a best practice, do this at least once in a month. Delete all your inactive accounts. So look for a solution that can automate the whole cleanup process and get those inactive accounts out of your system. So that's one recommendation. A follow-up recommendation would be to ensure that your existing accounts or service accounts with critical attributes are renamed. That's again, one common mistake a lot of organizations make. They do not consider the fact that admin accounts with the native names are easy targets for attackers. So have them renamed. That's a follow up uh, suggestion for you. Another pro tip would be to go and set up honeypots. Now, all these administrator accounts have a syntax to them. You can have honeypot accounts that pretend to be or have similar names as that of your administrator accounts and have them with no privileges at all and just sit and wait for an attacker to initiate an attack on these accounts. Now we are talking about sophisticated uh, attackers trying to use sophisticated tools to crack and get into uh, administrator accounts, right? It becomes easy to spot if you have already set a trap for them and pinpoint where did this originate from. 
And if it's an insider who's just curious to crack through the password of an administrator account, you would still know that because these are honeypot accounts that you're tracking left, right, center. You would have control over what activity is going on in these accounts. Now that's again another quick tip for you. Going a little further, unusual activity in terms of volume. Now that is a telltale sign. All of a sudden, a huge number of files or folders are reprovisioned, are deleted, are copied, then that definitely means that you are under an attack and you should at any given point in time have a provision to monitor and get notified if such changes are happening in real time. That's an, again an interesting use case for you. So through and through, again, it boils down to existing security practices that are already available in your system and trying to make the best use of it rather than looking outward. So we've established the fact that insiders can be potential threats, either knowingly or unknowingly. And these are the telltale signs for figuring out if there's going to be a potential compromise. And again, the last point right here is definitely account lockouts. We just discussed as to how easy it is to track account lockouts if you had an account lockout analyzer in place. And we're talking about a scenario where we're handling remote users. Our network is in the same as before. While your users were at work, majority of activities were tracked day in, day out, and there were already pre-established rules or policies that they had to adhere to just because they were at work. In fact, access to file and folders. Now, data security could have been a very easy thing because you would have had a no hard drive policy. Users cannot walk into your organization with a hard drive and just copy a critical file or a folder and walk out. That was impossible. But now, as we speak, there's been a tremendous adoption of cloud applications, especially ones around collaboration, especially ones like OneDrive, where critical business data, machine critical data gets saved. A lot of us have fast track. In fact, as I've been speaking to a lot of CISOs and CTOs, this is one of their major concerns. In the name of transformation, in the name of collaboration, a lot of us have fast tracked, maybe with the help of a vendor or by ourselves. And there are a few challenges that are innate to these platforms when you migrate at that speed. Being able to pinpoint as to what these challenges are, again, is a challenge. Now, we're talking about the Department of Homeland Security stepping in to give away best practices to analyze such user behavior. Now, that is the level of criticality of these cloud applications, especially in the last couple of months, Office 365 has become the sweet spot for every attacker out there. And all the business email compromises that we've been hearing are essentially Office 365 accounts and Azure AD accounts that are compromised. So you should be able to not just track anomalous activity, but also follow that up with access to files and folders or modifications that are done to permissions on file, files and folders, both on-prem and remember on cloud too. And if you're able to correlate all of this into one piece of information, nothing better than that, because the existing security solutions, they do not take into account that it is just the same user who is logging in from multiple platforms. ODW is an option. Uh, OWA, I mean, is an option or doing it on-prem is an option. Remote desktop connections are definitely an option. So you should at any given point in time be on top of the system, not just in levels of accesses, but also in quantums of accesses to easily spot a threat. Now that being said, yes, uh, at any given point in time, right after the analysis, you should also be able to proactively respond to that situation. Can I set up an automatic trigger that makes it difficult for the attacker to propagate any further because they've breached the threshold that you've set. So that is what we need to be working on. And I have a few tips and tricks to help you do that. We'll start by processing the logs that are there in your system already. You have a treasure chest full of logs. Now you can view it as a treasure chest if you probably can correlate the logs or it is probably a pile of uh, you know, information that's difficult to pass. That's difficult to understand if you cannot parse through the whole set of logs and pinpoint to those logs that are actually critical because logs get generated for everything and not being able to correlate that is definitely handicapping you from doing anything further. And establishing a dynamic baseline is probably making you a superhuman. We are talking about being able to draw dynamic baselines for every single user. While your users are working remotely, it's almost next to impossible to use threshold values or use blanket values. Now, every user has the flexibility to log in at any point in time of the day. 
most of them while working remotely, they don't tend to follow the best practices. And on top of it, they log into your system via their home networks. And we know how unsafe their home Wi-Fi connections could be. And attackers know this too. We've heard instances where critical stakeholders of critical organizations and conglomerates around the world, just because they were using their home network and the attackers were able to crack through their system, a lot of data was lost. An entire company is a financial institution quite recently faced this issue. You know who I'm talking about. So we're talking about insiders, not just knowingly, but unknowingly making these mistakes. So what do you do? The easiest thing is to make it foolproof. Now, how do you do that? By establishing baselines for your users. And we'll talk about user behavior analytics in detail during the rest of the session today. And identifying anomalies right on time and notifying the right stakeholders, again, is a great uh, has a great deal of importance in your incident response strategy. And if you can automate the whole thing, how cool is that? So if you're talking about automating, we will need to have a clear cut communication strategy. There are multiple stakeholders involved. Most of the times, right after an attack, once that is detected, the immediate response is panic. Organizations panic and then they let go of the attack or let, they let the attacker slip. So the last thing that you need to do is panic. And how can you ensure that? by getting notified right on time in all those platforms you're available. So that's just one aspect of it, because what if the attack had happened in a non-business hour? You wouldn't even be around to respond to it. And even before you could know it, it would have been too late. And that's the reason my recommendation to you would be to automate the whole incident response. Now, if you know there are a couple of problems that are common, it could be a brute force attack or a password spray attack or a DDoS attack or a all those common attacks. So what we did was we put together 200 such different potential attack scenarios. We built that into the tool. And if someone is trying to do an attack, anything of that sort, you'd be able to set, let your system handle that situation all by itself. You can have an automated incident response where probably scripts are run, the specific users are identified, the malicious user is kicked out, the session is logged out, the VPN connection is terminated, any aspect of access that the attacker could be potentially having is removed right away when the automated incident response system kicks in. So that is the idea with which you need to operate and make your cybersecurity foolproof. While business hours, great being notified is a very useful uh, action. But when you're not around, and especially while you're working remotely, this makes a lot of sense. So in along those lines, being able to track log on activity, like I earlier mentioned, could be one of those cornerstones in your cybersecurity strategies, especially if you're able to figure out what are the user accounts that have deviations and anomalies in them the most, when are they logging in and what's that deviation, if you can call that out, that would be fantastic. Now, I have a couple of use cases around log on monitoring. We just at the beginning of the webinar established that those two events for log on successful logons and failed logons are important. And I have an example of a brute force attack. We just spoke as to how important it is to correlate brute force attacks. But when your system can go beyond just correlating and track what activity happens right after that repeated 100 logon failures in less than a minute, followed by a successful logon, followed by the access to a critical fire order folder, and then installation of a malware, which essentially leads to exfiltration of data. That's the kind of insight that you should be getting. Now, we're talking about solutions that can give you context. So is the case with island hopping. An attacker does not remain in one endpoint. They try to get as much as foothold as possible. And in the process, they do it till they compromise the entire domain admin credentials. And like I pointed out earlier, UBA is your key to stop and spot these malicious insiders. And when it comes to UBA, UBA does it quite smart. It leverages machine learning. Now, every user is treated uniquely. There is no standard baseline or there is no uh, threshold value right here. Every user's activity is taken into account proactively and baselines are drawn dynamically. Now we're talking about a user, let's say J, logs in to work at 9 a.m. in the morning and logs out at 5 p.m. Now this is my usual activity. But now that I'm working at home, my logon activities are a little different. That does not mean you can have a threshold value set nine to five and have false positives. That's the last thing that you'd want to handle right now. And hence factors of context. 
the location, the geographical address, the IP reputation, the devices that are already enlisted in my system, the personal devices that I own, the Wi-Fi connection that I use, my, many such factors can be used as uh, context parameters and it can be mapped to my account and this can happen over time. With time, my system is smart enough to understand my behavioral pattern, not just in terms of my accesses, but also in terms of which files and folders am I uh, using or availing or modifying or what privileges do I have and how do I use them on a daily basis with respect to the time the volume, the resources that I'm accessing. And when there's a deviation in this, you should be alerted uh, for unusual count, time and resources. And that's how UBA works. So right when you can spot that anomalous behavior, now my log on hours while I work from home are longer than usual. They're from nine to nine, let's say. And all of a sudden, probably at 3 a.m. in the night, which is definitely not my time, there's a log on access that happens from a different geographical location, let's say in Nigeria we know how critical this situation is. We're talking about a different geographical location, a wrong time in the day, an IP address that has a poor reputation. And yes, don't forget the tool has an active integration with uh, threat intelligent platforms like WebRoot. You would know if it's a bad IP or if it's a blacklisted IP and you'd be able to quickly get on top of the situation. And the tool also gives you context. It says, J, the user who usually logs in from nine to nine, has this deviation of logging in early in the morning today and is accessing this file or folder. So you'd get that level of granularity when you're looking at user accounts and when you're trying to solve that problem of unusual logon. So is the case with lateral moment. A while back, we were talking about how attackers try to do a password spray. Now, when they're initiating the attack, they initiate it from a common source, but they try not to tip any of your systems by not attacking the same account. Rather, they spread across your organization, spread across accounts, use one weak password until they find that one user who used that weak password. So that would leave a lot of breadcrumbs. We're talking about one IP address where all these logon failures were initiated from. Though it did not tip off any of your systems for the count of logon failures, but it was that one IP address that had cost probably 1,000 logon failures, one account Per, uh, per time across your system. And that would probably mean that there's a high load of activity that is happening from that uh, account. And that it's a devious activity that gets quickly spotted. And so is the case with malwares that they try to install because eventually that is the goal. Once they crack through the domain admin credentials, they'd want to probably exfiltrate data. And especially if you're a healthcare organization, beware, there are so many regulations out there that want you to protect the PHI. Financial institutions, beware, we're talking about PII, personally identifiable information with bank records and transaction details, and you'd want to have a foolproof mechanism for that too. So stopping them from being able to install a malware is of the top of the order priority. And being notified if a file is installed for the first time with someone's privilege, now that is definitely going to be helpful. So through and through, where are we getting at? Through and through, all that we want to do is to be able to track privileges that these users have, is to be able to stop these users from doing anything uh, shady. We are trying to ensure that these insiders that we're talking about do not end up installing these malwares or using their privileges to their advantage. So you can start off with a simple logic where you say if there are any users who are privileged users, all of them by default are going to get tracked. So every user with the keys to your kingdom have to be tracked have to be monitored and when there's a deviation in behavior you have to be notified it could be the unusual volume of activity or it could be the privilege escalations that are happening or it could be the users who get added to groups so this was what i was talking about earlier today in the webinar being able to track privilege abuse being able to call out a user using their privileges unintentionally or intentionally to do something malicious so this is definitely what you should be looking for in a tool for a strong cybersecurity strategy. Yes, goes without saying, you would not just want to stop right here, would you not? You'd want to streamline the whole privilege management. Now we spoke about how critical uh, monitoring these accounts are. Most of the time, as I've spoken to uh, security leaders and CISOs and CTOs, the common observation is it becomes difficult for them to not water down their security policy while working remotely. 
a lot of users request for access and then start demanding for access and administrators for the greater good for the sake of business continuity grant these privileges now when they do it it becomes difficult to really ensure that there's a clear cut tracking mechanism and needing and the need to revoke those privileges once their time is done there are two cases possible one when a user is requesting for privileges that they don't need in first place end up being escalated that's number one and the next one is where users hold privileges without realizing it's wrong to have privileges that you would not use so these two cases right here can be solved if you have a clear cut request review approval mechanism it becomes absolutely easy if you can have a clear cut mechanism like this where only those users who need privileges make requests respective stakeholders in the line of command be able to look into those requests approve those requests and then it lands into your help desk or your it teams uh, you know bucket list i mean bucket and then from there you get to approve or deny those permissions so it becomes easy to track who's got what privileges and revoke them in case of an emergency and in the process you don't end up giving someone access privilege so we are talking about a zero trust mechanism i wouldn't trust anybody that's my rule de facto when someone wants privilege they have to go through an approval mechanism so this is a easy work around to ensure that privilege entitlement management or pem as they call it is foolproof i have a couple of reports right here that can get the job done for you we're talking about reports that can track and let you know log on activity deviations we're talking about user activity across both active directory and the cloud if you have office 365 yes that can be tied in too a couple of on prem and on, on or you know cloud platforms effortlessly monitored with all these functionalities in place very straightforward very easy to pinpoint a problem likewise modified group memberships you would know who are the users who got recently added to a group if you would want to also check privileges on a group or modifications done because attackers are quite smart they don't do attacks at the surface they probably do something like a group nesting that is indirectly have privileges for a group by nesting it with another critical group and then adding users to the nested group it would become very difficult to skim through all these levels to get to the point where you find out which account was actually responsible for the problem that way you'd be able to get nested group memberships and top modified groups out of the box and that is something that you can probably sign up for so is the case with locked out accounts if you can find out who are those that is absolutely fantastic file changes folder changes i have the entire list right here as to files modified folders modified namings renamed permissions altered the whole deal right here around changes that are happening and being able to monitor your file integrity yes it goes without saying remote access management is the need of the hour and it's quite critical monitoring your terminal services is also equally important from two aspects being able to allocate resources better to know who needs these accesses and revoke accesses on services and applications and at the same time if there's a security breach you'd want to quickly get access to remove them so at any given point in time you should have the god's eye view as to who are the users who logged into your system remotely that is a configuration that you need to be looking into now in the beginning of the webinar i was talking about how cloud adoption is fast tracked and microsoft has seen a 700% increase in installation of office 365 and microsoft teams you will have to start looking there as well if your organization is using teams what about all the data that's getting transferred right there shared right there files that are getting attached do you have an e discovery policy ask yourself that question if you're using one drive do you audit activity on one drive files and folder changes that are happening modifications that are done to privileges do you have that monitored because all of this boils down to safeguarding your pii and phi and your user information and your customer information as well because you have these new regulations like ccpa in place california consumer protection act what do you do at that point in time if you're breached what if, what if a uh, attacker demands a ransom for the PIA we are talking about the 321 backup rule i would want you to back up or make three copies of any data that is machine critical have two of them stored in different storage media and have one of them stored in a different geographical location so that is the 321 backup rule and works like magic almost every time so look for such easy uh, ways to ensure double security or double up your security so so far we've discussed 
as to why is it important to monitor those critical AD events. I have a list of 25 critical AD events while working remotely. I just gave you a preview of the first five. There are 20 more that you can monitor and be 100% sure that your remote uh, Active Directory or your remote identity access management is absolutely secure. Goes without saying, implementing UBA, being able to track activity on cloud, ensuring that there's a clear cut privilege escalation mechanism is fundamentally important along with that one problem that I've been addressing throughout the webinar, which is account lockout analysis. So be in the know. Know why exactly did an account lockout. Find out that root cause. If it's a security issue, address that. If it's a logistical issue, let the user know and educate them. Or if it's probably just a mishap like a poor network driving mapping, or a scheduled task with a stale credential, you can have all of that fixed because the last thing that you'd want to deal with is account lockouts while you're trying to fight other fights. So these were my recommendations for you for today's session around cybersecurity while you're working remotely. I've also authored a couple of eBooks that can help you uh, go alongside uh, and you know get your password security done right, your multi-factor authentication done right. And yes, I've put together a couple of resources around uh, industry-specific security at remote work. So if you have, if you're working for let's say healthcare, banking, or finance, or let's say education or any other of that industry like government for that matter too, just drop me a message. I have my email ID that's coming up on my screen and we're making the tool also available for all users for absolutely free of cost while you're working remotely. Just let me know if you want exclusive access. I can have it arranged. My name is Jay Reddy. My email ID is right on the screen. The session was recorded. You have questions, shoot them right now. I'll take them. If you want a copy of the webinar, the 25 list event IDs that I was talking about or any of uh, you know, you want any of your cybersecurity questions answered, drop me a mail. I'd be more than happy to touch base with you and have that resolved. So thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience. I'm going to stick around for another couple of minutes to take your questions. You've been such a lovely audience. Guys, if there's one request that I have from my side, please do take care, stay safe. And the next time when we meet, I want to meet under better circumstances when Corona and the whole pandemic is a thing of the past. Good luck to you all and thank you so much for being such a sweet audience and do write to me. Looking forward to talk to you real soon, guys. Thank you so much. If you'd be interested in the event log analyzer, yes. A part of what we discussed today are functionalities from the event log analyzer. Just in case if you'd be interested, you have my email ID. I can send you probably recordings of our previous webinars that talk more about the event log analyzer. And I'd be more than happy to help, help you out with that. I hope I've answered your question, Delano. Just in case if you'd want more information on Event Log Analyzer, I'd be more than happy to send you. We've got exclusive webinars and resources for that product. The one that we discussed today is a bigger product, which is Log 360 and AD360, that Encompose Event Log Analyzer. If you want any specific questions or uh, answered, you can definitely drop me an email and I'd be more than happy to share details. Oh yeah, Steve, yes. User behavior analytics also is a part of the Law 360 that we're talking about. It's an exclusive module, quite smart when it comes to uh, handling, you know, deviations in actual behavior. It does a lot of weightlifting. <clears throat> uh, does a lot of weightlifting when it comes to analyzing deviations and patterns. We do provide support for your installation. If you if you're interested, yes, we can arrange a demo. So all of you who are joining, if you want more information or if you want a one on one session with me where I can break down the tool for you, understand your environment better and sit with you to figure out what's the best way forward or the cybersecurity strategy, uh, you know, putting together a strategy for you. I've been we've been doing it for a lot of organizations in the last 120 days. We're trying to go remote. I'd be more than happy to do that for you as well. Just let me know. Just feel free to write an email and I can have and get on a one-on-one -on -one session with you and help you go through the whole tool.
absolutely yes that's possible even for those who wanted to like watch the webinar for event log analyzer or for any other product that you have if you think or if you prefer talking to me directly would make a lot of sense because we can have a two way discussion that would absolutely be possible just drop me an email and I'd appreciate uh, that pretty much we want to help we are here to help we'd be more than glad to do that for you lovely we are on top of the hour thank you so much grace you've been such a lovely audience looking forward to all those emails that you are about to send we'll take the conversation forward there and if we can probably catch up for a quick call nothing better than that please do take care and stay safe my name is jay reddy talk to you real soon take care bye bye